Hey everyone, Christina Simmons from CES to Holiness here with just a quick reminder that if you want the full episode of this podcast, go and check it out on your favorite streaming platform. It could be Spotify, it could be Apple Podcasts, it could be the myriad of, I think there's hundreds of different platforms out there, or at least more than a hundred. And so wherever it is that you're listening to podcasts, go and find the CES to Holiness podcast there. And I look forward to speaking spending time with you there. So our food for the head comes from Saint Dominic. He says, a man who governs his passions is master of his world. We must either command them or be enslaved by them. It is better to be a hammer than an anvil. As we're coming up on Lent, it's so important for us to be mindful of that we are called to become masters of our passions, not be mastered by them. I know this is really difficult in our world that's all about easy and all about immediate gratification. And I know that many times we can get frustrated by hearing over and over again, you know, that we need to be governing our passions because it makes it seem like uh, our passions are bad. And that's not the case at all. But we have to bear in mind that all of who we are needs to be focused upon becoming fully who we are created to be. And this means that we need to always be attentive to guiding and focusing our efforts to become the saint God created us to be. As the Lenten season begins, that is the great invitation of Lent. The great invitation of Lent is inviting us ever deeper into relationship with God, to come to know Him, love Him, and serve Him more fully. And this is what the great three Lenten resolutions are all about, of prayer and fasting and almsgiving. It's for us to be able to govern our passions. It's so that we are no longer enslaved by them. We're no longer responding, but we're being proactive. It doesn't mean that we have to say no to our passions, but rather not now. So it's about us responding when is appropriate, when it is what will bring us closer to being uh, virtuous. This is how um, when we are governing our passions, Um, then we no longer are going to be at their mercy. And, you know, the world tells us that if we're strong enough willed, then we can eat or drink or whatever it is that we enjoy and brings us and brings us momentary pleasure. And let's remember that for a minute, momentary pleasure that if we're strong enough will that we can indulge and then we can say no at a later time. But the fact is, is that you don't become virtuous so that when the hard times come and they always come, that we're able to do the good easily and quickly and with joy. And that's what to be a person of virtue is. So if we are not governing our passions, then when the time comes to choose to do the good quickly, easily, and with joy, we're not going to be able to do it. So St. Dominic reminds us of this. He reminds us that there's no in-between. He reminds us that the world, okay, is wrong, is that... If we think that we can temporarily indulge in our passions, give you know, give free rein to them, and that we think that we'll be able to gather the reins back. For anyone who's a horseback rider out there, I, I grew up riding horses, and if you give free rein to your horse and they're doing whatever they want, and then when it comes time to gain control again, it is a battle. It is a serious battle. And for any of us who are parents out there, you know this to be the case as well. You allow your kids to kind of get off their normal bedtime routine, right? During vacations, whatever, they stay up late, you're doing things, and then you try to get the routine back. How hard is it? 
Well, this is no different than our passions and governing them as well. So we have to develop virtue and we do it day by day. This is where, again, the beauty of the Lenten season assists us. It helps us because we can make resolutions that we can build into sustainable habits that will continue long beyond Lent. So it's not about what you're giving up, but rather about how are you becoming stronger? How are you firming up that foundation so that you do become that virtuous person so that when challenges happen, then we're not going to be found to be at the mercy of our passions, but rather in command of them. And this is where we become that hammer. We are able to hammer whatever the situation is that we're facing, that challenge, that difficulty, we're able to bring the hammer of love, the hammer of joy, the hammer of peace, the hammer that is going to have us be lights and witnesses of God's love and mercy and not be hammered upon. So it's something where to be the hammer is far better than to be the anvil. So use this opportunity of the Lenten season to become more fully that hammer, to become more fully virtuous so that when the storms of life come, and we know that they will, we're able to do the good quickly, easily, and with joy. Our food for the heart comes from St. Paul of the Cross. He says, build an oratory within yourself, and there have Jesus on the altar of your heart. Speak to him often while you are doing your work. Speak to him of his holy love, of his holy sufferings, and of the sorrows of most holy Mary. Again, during this Lenten season, the church asks us to be particularly attentive to those traditional resolutions associated with the practices of prayer and fasting and almsgiving. Why these? Well, St. Paul, you know, gives us a beautiful way to live out the resolution of prayer, of where we're constantly speaking to God within ourselves, and we have Jesus upon the altar of our heart. We can speak to God about anything as we're going about our work. We can speak to him about how much he loves us, about the many blessings that he has given us. We can speak to him about whatever it is that might be troubling us, that is challenging us. We could speak to him about his sufferings and asking, why Lord, did you have to come and suffer? And to give insight into that very simply is so that suffering has meaning. Now, God came and took senseless suffering and he gave it purpose. He gave it meaning. He gives us the opportunity to take these meaning, meaningless, you know, seemingly absolutely random things that happen, good things happen, you know, bad things happen to good people kind of moments. And he gives us the opportunity to bring good out of them. Now, we might not be able to see what the good is. And that's usually when we'll struggle with faith. This is when we'll struggle because we won't be able to see God's big plan. And this is where we got to get used to different. We got to get used to the idea that God works differently. This is part of why we need to be about prayer and fasting and almsgiving so that we can be adopting this different perspective so that we can be adopting God's different way of bringing about goodness. God always brings about good for those who love him. St. Paul tells us this in Romans, but so often we won't believe that. We'll set that aside because it's not happening in the way that we think it should happen, or we don't see it happening at all. So we have to get used to different. And the only way we can do that again is by spending time with our Lord in prayer, in conversation. And St. Paul of the Cross 
gives us a beautiful way to be able to do that constantly. So even if you're super busy, even if you seem to be running from thing to thing to thing, you still have moments of where you can be having conversation with God, of where you can be asking him for his wisdom, his insight, so that you can prudently respond to the challenges that you have, or so that he is able to give you knowledge that will help you be able to see more clearly how it is that something might be able to come about that wasn't going to come about unless this thing had happened, this what seemingly senseless thing had happened. Why do we fast? We fast so that we don't get too comfortable, so that we don't get comfortable with here. We need to become detached from whatever it is that is keeping us in place from whatever it is that's keeping us from moving ever deeper into relationship with our Lord. We need to look at our fasting, not just as things that we fast from in the sense of food, but what is it that we need to fast from that is going to help us open up space for God to come and fill us. John the Baptist says, less of me, more of him. I must decrease, he must increase. Well, you can't fill an already filled cup. This is why we fast. We fast so that our cup, us, our hearts, our minds are not still full. They are being emptied. And into this emptiness, into this emptiness, God is able to step in. This is why we fast. And this is why with prayer and fasting, the grace, the power of the Holy Spirit can come and fill us and then our prayers bear fruit. How often do we fast sacrifice for the prayer that we're offering? How often do we do that double punch? You know, the, uh, the whole purpose of, again, of our fasting along with prayer, that sacrifice with prayer is so that we can be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his own disciples when they said, Lord, why, why couldn't we get rid of the, the demons that were, that were here? Why couldn't we heal this man? And Jesus says, because it takes prayer and sacrifice. It takes prayer and fasting. This is this interaction. So with prayer and fasting, we create that space where God can come and fill us. And then why almsgiving? Because when we are filled, it's not just for us. We are not being filled with grace and with love and with mercy for ourselves only. All of what we are being given is for the benefit of others. This is why we have the threefold mandate of prayer and fasting and almsgiving. And when we do this, then we have that opportunity to truly build that oratory, that great church of our interior life so that God can come and be within it and Jesus can be laid on the altar of our heart and so that we are able to journey with Jesus all the way through Calvary so that on Easter Sunday we truly can celebrate. Our food for the hands comes from St. Francis of Paola. He says, put aside your hatred and animosity. Take pains to refrain from sharp words. If they escape your lips, do not be ashamed to let your lips produce the remedy, since they have caused the wound. Pardon one another so that later on you will not remember the injury. The recollection of an injury is itself wrong. It adds to our anger, nurtures our sin, and hates what is good. It is a rusty arrow and poison for the soul. It puts all virtue to flight. St. Francis tells us here what happens when we don't let go of our hatred, when we don't let go of our animosity, when we don't refrain, especially from sharp words. Our tongue is a sharp-edged sword. It can harm and it can heal. How it works 
is dependent upon us. So we must remember that if we do cause injury, we also have the remedy and we should not hesitate to apologize. We should not hesitate to immediately seek restitution with the person that we have harmed or persons. We should never try to hold on to our own anger. We should always allow it to be set aside because all that anger is doing is nurturing sin. All it's doing is helping us hate what is good. Now, I'm not talking about, for example, someone who is harming us that we have to you know, allow that abuse, for example, to continue to happen. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is the fact that when we hold on to anger and hate, it's destroying us. It's not destroying or harming the person whom we have anger or hate towards. More often than not, people aren't even aware that we have anger or hate even in our hearts towards them. So we have to be very, very attentive of how it is that we need to put aside our hatred and animosity. Um, you know, St. Francis, uh, you know, two things came to mind. First one of the fact of refraining from sharp words. Uh, one practice that I share with people often that I mentor and I, I speak about the four S's. And those four S's are, you know, when we're trying to uh, refrain, especially from saying angry things or sharp things. So the first S is stop. So in other words, we stop. We don't say anything, we stop. Then we swallow whatever words it were that we were going to say. Third is silence. We are in silence <clears throat> and then we suffer. We offer that suffering up on behalf of the person that we are going to speak sharply to. So what are we doing? This cycle is helping us be transformed, but it's also helping us offer sacrifice along with a prayer for the person that just annoyed us. In this way, we aren't just transformed, but also we're interceding and loving the person before us, the person who we were going to speak those sharp words to. And it might be justified or completely unjustified. It doesn't matter. Practice those four S's and you will be amazed at the difference that it makes. So many times we forget that when we are speaking injurious words when we are angry, then it puts virtue to flight. And this is the most important thing for us to remember is that when virtue flees, then no good remains. So we need to try and do all that we can to fast, not just from sharp words, but maybe it's fasting from being right all the time. It might be fasting from having the last word um, you know, to be able to prove that we're right. There's so many ways that we can fast so that our hearts can be converted and so that we can grow in love of others and we can become more virtuous like Christ. This is that call. Our food for the feet comes from Blessed Charles de Foucault. He said, crosses release us from this world and by doing so, bind us to God. All of the Lenten season is designed in order to help us walk with Christ, walk with Him, come to know Him and love Him more deeply so that when we get to the great three days, the great triduum of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, which leads of course into Easter, that we are able to accompany Him and so that when he accepts his cross, we more freely, joyfully accept our own. This is what it is to offer sacrifice. This is what it is to suffer. When we are suffering and offering those sufferings, those sacrifices up out of love for others, we are imitating Christ on the cross. 
This Lenten season is designed so that we can become better at detaching ourselves from the things that we think are important and instead focus upon the things that bind us more tightly to God. This is how crosses can work. And at the beginning of this podcast, I believe I made mention of the fact that the cross, <clears throat> crosses are, you know, what are the great gift that we have because they now have meaning. God has come and through his suffering, death, and resurrection, he has given meaning to all the suffering, all the senseless things that happen in our world, good can come about from them. God can work to the good if we get used to different. If we get used to God's plan, if we abandon ourselves to His will, if we trust in Him, and we can only do this by spending time in conversation with him each day. We can only do this by being filled with his grace so we can live that life of grace. We can only do this by striving to grow in virtue more and more so that we can imitate him and we can be his signs in the world that desperately needs it. We have to be able to love as Christ loves. And the only way that we can love as Christ loves is for us to be detached, not in a I don't feel kind of detachment, but rather in a Lord doesn't matter if I'm sick or if I'm well. Lord doesn't matter if I'm rich or I'm poor. Lord, it doesn't matter if it's sunny or it's raining. Lord, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that I am able to be a witness and share the good news. And what is the good news? That Jesus is crucified and rose from the dead because he loved us so that we too can have eternal life. Darkness, sin, and death are no more. How get used to different can you get? And that's what the Lenten season invites us into. It invites us to go ever deeper into this mystery so that we can proclaim it from the hilltops, so that we can proclaim it just by our very lies. And we do this, we become, we do this more and more by loving as Christ loves. We do this so that we are signs of his love and mercy, so others can encounter his love and mercy, so that together we can be transformed and together we can live for all eternity bound in love, with love, by love. We were created for holiness, for transforming union with God. We were created for that. This is what God created us for. He created us to be the particular saint that he created us to be. I'm going to be a different saint than you are. And each and every person in and around your life are created to be saints that God created them to be. We're not all supposed to be St. Catherine's and St. Francis's of Assisi's. And, you know, we're not supposed to be other saints. We're supposed to be us. We are supposed to embrace that difference, a unique and unrepeatable sign of who we are, of God's love and mercy in the world. We are supposed to embrace it and we're supposed to embody it. How? by loving as Christ loves, by accepting the crosses that come. And as we offer these crosses up, people can see that they bring meaning, not just to our lives, but to the lives of others. Anytime that we say yes to those things that we do not like, we did not choose, we cannot change, and we don't understand, and we trust that God is working, we are a sign that sin, darkness, and death don't have the last word. We are a sign that there is hope. We are a sign that to have faith means to live in love, with love, and through love. That is our call. And that's the power of the cross. And that's the essence of what we're about during Lent. So how will you say yes this Lent?